please prepare for a highly opinionated presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, for inviting me to participate in this event. Java, the world's most populated island, has been ruled and unruled by countless number of ethnic and religiously based dynasties since 10,000 BC. Today, Java holds the central government of an archipelago called the Republic of Indonesia which through push and pull, negotiation and wars, achieved independence from the Dutch in 1945. Within this Javanese-led republic lies a special district, which is ambiguously autonomous from the central government. This is the special district of Yogyakarta, where I have lived for the last 15 years, now with my husband and son. Yogyakarta is special because it is a monarchy within a republic. Special because it is currently ruled by the 10th king of the late Mataram kingdom. Special because he is also the governor of the province, which under provincial laws has been an unelected position since 1950. Therefore, the special district of Yogyakarta is ruled by a king who is an unelected representative of a democratic republic. <coughs> the palace in Yogyakarta is teeming with courtiers. I interviewed several of them, both inside and outside the palace, to get a perspective on the meaning of special district. Land has been a key issue well before the establishment of special district in 1950. Land has been an expression of monarchical existence well before the king took on the recent role of governor. For hundreds of years, land was used and structured to critically imprint Yogyakarta's royal dominance over space and the imagination of its populace. 
From the Marapi volcano to the north, Jogjakarta was molded in an imaginary line that leads from the mountain to the Golongilik monument at the fringe of the city. Sultan Agong, first of the current line of kings, was said to be the main contributor to this discourse. Golong means king, Gilik means people. This monument was erected by the monarchy to express unity between the two. This line continues south to the palace of Jogjakarta, which is a rabbit warren of structures, gates, fields, and trees, all with mystical meaning. Ben Anderson described the overpopulation around the palace as the people's desire to be closer to power. Other academics contested that this was all the space the Dutch allowed. Following the line south, the Kandang Menjangan monument is where royals would hunt wildlife. It is said that during hunting season, courtiers would shoo the deer towards the structure to improve the king's aim. From here, the line leads south towards the Indian Ocean, where royal rituals are performed every year for the goddesses of the southern seas. Apart from its individual points, the entire line is, to, is said to reflect Javanese cosmology of fire and water, volcano and sea, and the palace's balance between the two. It is also said to reflect the passage of human life from birth till death. In death, all kings of the Mataram dynasty are housed, as per their elevated status, on a mountain range east of this line. Here on Mount Marat lies the royal cemetery of Mataram kings. The royal cemetery of Mataram contains the graves of 26 kings, their families, and its architect. To exemplify the hierarchy of those placed here, one has to climb 442 steps to reach it. In Javanese mysticism, this is the only true way for commoners to access the cemetery. Each deceased royal was carried up these steps by courtiers who regarded it as a privilege. At the top, you are exhausted and overwhelmed dominated by the architecture, and punished by the purpose of the visit, which is to perform the act of ziara. <laughs> In Islamic belief, ziara means offering prayers for the dead. In this cemetery, the only grave open to the public belongs to Sultan Agung, responsible for Jogjakarta's imaginary line. However, because Sultan Agung originated from Hindu Buddhist beliefs, which regarded him as a deity, the act of ziara is folded into an act of worship towards a specific goal, which is to achieve strength, popularity, longevity, or wealth. On an average week, Sultan Agung Cemetery may see hundreds of visitors coming to perform ziara. Women in particular wear specific costume when visiting the cemetery of the late king. No cameras are allowed in the cemetery of Sultan Agung. From what people have described, there is a large grave made of white stone covered by a beautiful wooden structure, perfectly kept with ample and lush surroundings.
If I were to describe Jogjakarta, it would be called the place of the unsaid. What I cannot say in this lecture, I have subtitled to emphasize what Jogjakartans do not speak of. Public critics of the special district status have either been ousted from the province by thugs or prosecuted in court by the district's overzealous supporters. Though I've been working on this lecture for weeks, I've even kept its contents from my husband. Javanese society gets around this culture of the unsaid by complicating language, particularly in proverb and song. Translations are never its meaning. Expressions are always hidden under layers of colloquialized language. The next clip will combine what is most unsaid in Jogjakarta society with a song shared with me by Bapa Sukino. Bapa Sukino's song described how you will be questioned by angels at the time of death and you will answer according to the prayers and deeds you have offered in life. Everyone involved in making this lecture performance, my assistant, her spiritual advisor, my videographer and editor, all communicated the same meaning of this song, that you cannot take your wealth with you into the next world, so do not obsess on it in this one, particularly at the expense of others. Thank you. <laughs> 